Let's first talk about the title LSAT. The LSAT stands for the Law School Admissions Test. It's given by the LSAC, the Law School Admissions Council, and it's designed to test your law school readiness. Now, a lot of people think that this type of test doesn't actually test your law school readiness, but I happen to love the test and I completely disagree. I think it tests your executive functioning under pressure, your ability to focus on evidence and accuracy instead of leading with feeling, which is exactly the kind of thing that you need to do not only in law school, but also in front of a judge. So. I hope you enjoy this podcast and you also enjoy how much I love the podcast. Many of the students that I work with as an LSAT tutor think that my excitement for this test is absolutely ridiculous and yet they find it pretty contagious too. So let's get started. The LSAT itself has three distinct sections. One is called the analytical reasoning that many people informally call the logic games section. There's a logical reasoning section, which requires you to analyze arguments and answer different questions about them. And then the third section is called the reading comprehension section. And that one's pretty traditional. There are three passages that you're gonna answer that each have five to eight questions connected to them. And then there's a fourth one that we call a comparative passage where you have two authors that are speaking about a same topic with the same topic, but from a different perspective. And so you're gonna answer questions about their points of agreement and their points of contention. Now this LSAT is not the only thing that law schools are gonna consider when they're looking at your application for admission. That LSAC, L-S-A-C, the Law School Admissions Council, they have a system where they manage all of your application information and then help you get it submitted to law school. When I say help, I mean it comes at a pretty high price. You're required to use their system. It's called the CAS system. Costs over $400 just to apply to one school, Um, but for just a little over $600, you can apply to six schools. So with that deal, you get a lot of law students who, when they realize they want to apply to more than one school, might go ahead and apply to six, 12, or even 18, which from a potential scholarship negotiation standpoint, it would be great to get so many different acceptance letters that you could give a speech to your whole family and throw on the hat and say, hey folks, I'm going to Maryland or wherever it is that you wanna go. Those other parts of your application are really critical. They are no less significant than your LSAT score. In fact, if you go to the LSAC website, They have this calculator where you can stick in your undergrad GPA and your LSAT score or your, you know, hopeful or your dream LSAT score, your target LSAT score, play around, put in different numbers, and you can see what your chances are of getting into the different schools that you might categorize as your safety schools, which would be your shoe-in schools, your target schools, which you have about a 35 to 70 percent chance of getting in and then your dream schools which your chance of getting in are maybe you know 15 percent or below so you know having a good amount of each means that you're nearly guaranteed to get into a law school but that you also have some options and likely different scholarship awards that go with that other parts of your application that your law school will see involve things that you write there's your resume There's what's called a character and fitness statement, which is just a list of any convictions, infractions beyond just usually parking violations. Some schools even forego moving violations and they just want to know the ones that are um, the most egregious or reckless based on particular state codes. So you have to look very carefully. Most of the students that we work with have something that they have to put on there, whether it's a um, just driving at a high rate of speed or it's an open container citation at school don't worry the most important thing is to reveal whatever you need to reveal you don't want to lie that shows a lack of credibility 
We'll talk more about that particular statement in a later episode. The other things that you would have to submit are what's called a personal statement, and then there's an optional diversity statement, as well as an optional essay you can submit to explain any low grades or discrepancy in grades in high school or undergrad. Although usually people would just focus on undergrad. Like if something were to happen or had happened in your sophomore or junior year and you had to leave school briefly for financial or family reasons, those are the types of things that a school would want to know because that explains why there might have been a drop in your grade, but not, you know, a drop in your motivation and desire to go to law school. As far as your motivation and desire to go to law school, that is where the personal statement and diversity statement really take shape. So the personal statement is something that you're going to write to each school that essentially connects what motivates you as a human being the good, bad, or ugly things that have happened in your life connects them to why you're driven to go to law school and to practice law. It's an important piece of your application. And for many students that we've worked with, the personal statement alone, when you really, really put in your X factor and make your case for why you need to be at that school, that it's the difference between getting in and not getting in. And for some students, it's the difference between not getting in and getting in with scholarship money. We'll talk more about the personal statement in a later episode as well. Finally, that brings us to the diversity statement. And the diversity statement is designed to address those things about you that are either immutable or just so unique and significant in your growth and development and your desire to become an attorney that you'd be remiss not to share it. Because if I'm sitting in a law school office and I work in admissions and I get to your essay and I go, this is the kind of student that I want to be in my class so that I can hear them speak and discuss their perspective in our conversations so that we have diverse perspectives. That's the kind of thing you want to include, whether it's about race, gender, sex, nationality. Um, can't think of many other things that people write about that uh, kind of speak to their diversity. But if it's diverse to you within your upbringing, then it matters. I've had students who grew up in environments where they felt like they were just like everyone in their community. But when compared to the community that they would be in in law school, they were diverse. And so that was reason for that person to develop a statement. We're going to move into the top five questions that we receive whenever we get phone calls from prospective LSAT students. So here come your top five. The first question we get is, am I too old to go to law school? And quite simply, the answer is no, not at all. The oldest student that we've worked with was 62. He graduated law school at 65 and he is now practicing family law. You're never too old. In fact, that is one of those things that makes you diverse and you might want to include it in a diversity statement. Many people do go into law school right after undergrad. Many people take a gap year. Others work in another profession for years before they decide they want to switch gears. Many students that were paralegals for many years decided that they too wanted to become attorneys. And so they meet with us and tutor for the LSAT on their lunch break. You are never, ever too old to pursue your dream. The second question we get is, is law school only for students who don't have disabilities? The answer to that one is also no. We work with many students who have cognitive, psychological, visual, and physical disabilities. We help them get accommodated to take the LSAT. We help them get accommodated in law school, and they end up succeeding just like their ABLE peers. And when I say ABLE, I mean no disrespect to anybody with any dis disabilities or any challenges. I personally have serious visual disabilities. I because of uh, an accident three years ago, I had a blowout of my orbital socket and I couldn't see for the better part of two years. 
Now I wear special glasses, I cover all of my computers with special screens, and I use very large font everywhere so that I can see clearly. Why would I not go to law school if I was just a prospective LSAT student just because I had a vision disability? That is not what law school and being an attorney is about. We're about inclusiveness. We do not discriminate. We do not retaliate. We are attorneys. If you have any questions about whether your disability will cause you a functional limitation when taking your exam, give us a call and we'll talk about what it would be like for you to test with appropriate accommodations. Many students that we work with that have anxiety, ADD, ADHD, PTSD, depression, they test with 50% extra time, some even with a private room. So reach out. You can contact us at ginsburgadvancedtutoring.com and have a private confidential phone call with us to see whether or not accommodations would be appropriate for you. Question number three, do I need to pay for a group class in order to prep for the LSAT? The answer to this one is also no. There are so many affordable options now for you to be able to individualize your test prep. From the free resources at LSAC, to self-guided tutorials, to books like the strategy guide that my company puts out that are intended to be workbooks and guided homework for you, there are plenty of individualized options. There's also tutoring. There's a variety of different tutors out there for the LSAT. Our company happens to provide a unique type of tutoring where we provide an individualized curriculum to you that keys up to our strategy guide as well as official practice test questions. And we've had tremendous, tremendous improvement among scores from students who did try group classes and had not been successful. And unfortunately, they were just in a situation where because they had already spent money on a group class, they didn't have as much money for individualized tutoring. I myself had done a group class when I took the LSAT many years ago, back in 2005, but because it wasn't moving at the pace that I wanted to, and it was set around a target score that for me wasn't sufficient, I felt that it didn't meet my needs and I too needed something beyond a group class. And so I did a very rigorous self-study along with a few sessions with a tutor and that got me over the hump that I was looking for. Question four, if I'm not a great test taker, can I prep for the LSAT in just a couple weeks? The answer again is gonna be no to this one. If you're not a great test taker, you can't just think about the content of the exam as the end all be all for you. Like maybe you're great with logical reasoning, maybe you're great with reading, uh, maybe you're great with Excel spreadsheets and statistics, which arguably is, is very helpful for the games or the analytical reasoning section. But if you don't have your strategy in place and if you don't have mental clarity, then you're not going to see the performance that you want to see on test day within just two weeks. What we generally recommend is that you want to carve out 40 to 70 hours to study for the LSAT. And if you only have two and a half to three and a half hours a week to commit, then you're going to want to set up a study plan that lasts about four months. So be realistic and reasonable with your time. If you can do more in a week, if you could do 10 hours of studying in a week, well, shoot, why not sign up for a test four to six weeks from now? Might as well see what you can do. But this is a part-time job. It needs to be treated as such. If you only have time for a small part-time job, then be realistic about your study goals and your test goals. This brings us to question number five. If I wanna to go to a top school, should I aim for a 170 right out the gate? Unsurprisingly, the answer to this one is gonna be a no to. What we do is we recommend that you shoot for 14 questions correct per section and shoot for the 150 first, and then you can graduate from your goal of a 150. The highest score you could get would be a 180. So we have to be a little realistic that you're not gonna be perfect right out the gate, but if you wanna shoot for that, it's perfectly fine, but let's take it incrementally. After you can get 14 right per section, shoot for 19 per section. 19 
per section on average would get you to a 160. And lastly, if you want to get that 170, then you need to hit 23 questions correct per section. That doesn't leave much room for error, so it's best to practice and make your mistakes early so that you can learn from those mistakes and then reach the 170 that you're looking for. That's it for season one, episode one. Thank you so much for tuning in to our very first episode. If you liked what you heard, please come back for the next session where we dig a little bit deeper into logical reasoning. You can also get more resources, tips, and all sorts of strategies by heading to our website, Ginsburg Advanced Tutoring.com. Again, that's Ginsburg Advanced Tutoring.com. Thank you so much, and we hope you enjoy your week. Take care. The podcast you just heard was made using Anchor. Ever thought about making your own podcast? Anchor makes it really easy for anyone to get started. It's a one stop shop for recording, hosting, and distributing podcasts. Best of all, it's a hundred.